So good afternoon. I'm Denise Tetsuki, Dean of Libraries, and I am pleased to welcome you today to our scholarship event. So we are recording this session, and as with our other events, we will post the recording on the library's YouTube channel. We will have time at the end for questions and comments, and I ask everyone to please stay muted throughout the presentation so we don't have echoes in the library. The 2021-22 academic year marks the 10th anniversary of scholarship. Our very first scholarship event was held in March 2012, and we have hosted three events per academic year ever since. This event started off as a way for the libraries to help build Drexel's cross-campus intellectual community and to share a toast to the end of the academic year, and we're delighted to continue that tradition 10 years later. To celebrate 10 years, we made the very bold decision to host 10 Food for Thought sessions <laughs> running through the end of the spring term. So we're almost to the finish line. Today's scholarship marks our ninth event. And I, I uh, have to give credit where credit is due. This brilliant idea and bold decision was that of our communicate, library's communication and events manager, Stacey Stanislav, who uh, also, yes, does get a round of applause for being able to pull it off. And as I said, gee, this is really a good idea. Should we do 11 next year? And she sort of looks like I, I, can't, I can't have her uh, um, <laughs> but I mean, with that great idea. But anyway, I think um, it's been fun to, to try to see what happens when we offer these mix, mix of them. So our final scholarship event for the year will be held on June 6th, so please mark your calendar, in the Study Hotel, which is just next door here on uh, 33rd on, on uh, Chestnut. So our final, um, so with, with that toe, we will have a virtual option via Zoom for those who can't join this in person, but it will be there in person. And I hope you will join us as we wrap up this amazing year of events and do the true tradition of toasting another, not only another 10 years, but the end of the term. So now I'm pleased to give a brief introduction to, the, to today's ninth scholarship speaker. Assistant Professor from the College of Computing and Informatics, Shahin Jabari. Professor Jabari joined Drexel University in fall 2021. His research and teaching interests include machine learning and algorithmic fairness and game theory, specifically focusing on the ethical aspects of algorithmic decision-making and how artificial intelligence driven technology can make a positive societal impact. Prior to coming to Drexel, Professor Jahari was a Center for Research on Computation and Society of CRCS, postdoctoral fellow in the Computer Science Department of the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences at Harvard University, and was also affiliated with the Econ CS Group. He holds a PhD in Computer Science from the University of Pennsylvania. So before I turn the Zoom controls over to Professor Zahari, let me continue our scholarship tradition. The last part of the name of this program is always very important to remember, and that's to raising a virtual toast. So I hope you have something for which you can join us. And uh, in doing so, why don't we make the toast for, uh, this is week 10 or 11? I know the students are besides themselves around here, and so everybody's under stress. So be kind to them, uh, help them get through <laughs> this last lap of the term. Here, here to the end of the spring term. To finishing this breakthrough. So thank you again for joining us today. And Chakan, over to you. Um, thanks for the nice introduction. So happy to be here. Um, can you all see my screen? All right, um, I'm going to get us started. Um, you need to present the notes. Is that your plan? Uh, no. We have Let me just do this now. thing. Uh, this is better? Uh, yeah. Okay. Does this work now? OK. Um, so I'm planning to have a very short and um, sort of high level talk of um, some of the um, some of the work that I do, um, and some of the directions that might be interested um, to people in here, um, and then I leave plenty of time for question and answer. 
But if there is anything that is very urgent, um, just tell Rachel no, and um, we can have an interruption. But this is supposed to be a very high level, um, 15 to 20 minute introduction uh, to the sort of problems I've been thinking about over the last uh, few years. And the title of this talk is Fairness and Explainability in Automated Decision Making. So let me just right dive to uh, what do I mean by automated decision making? Um, so most of you have heard the term machine learning. It's just a branch of artificial intelligence. And usually uh, machine learning involves uh, you learning something from um, some data to make some prediction. Uh, we've been seeing example of machine learning systems every day and kind of work with them on a daily basis. One example, uh, which is a very um, old school example of machine learning is spam filtering. Um, so your Gmail to decide whether an email is a spam or not, it uses a machine learning algorithm. There are more complex ways that we use machine learning in a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, for example, autocorrect is one of, um, one of these ways whether prediction at a high level also falls into machine learning. Um, so the idea of using algorithm to make predictions is, uh, has been around for a long time. Um, but recently we've been using them in more sort of high impact situations compared to the situation that we had um, in the past. So for example, in the past, we were using the systems for spam filtering or autocorrect. Now we're using them in settings with more impact like lending, hiring, uh, and medical diagnosis. And we'll see examples of this um, in a second. But among uh, all of these different applications, one thing that is in common is uh, the way we kind of use machine learning is in a way that we have access to a black box that has that, that makes very good decisions, but um, we don't really know how the system works in general, mainly because many of these uh, machine learning systems that we use are proprietary. Um, and throughout this talk, I want you to think about this question, do I don't really um, go through detail uh, in every domain that I talk about? Uh, and I want you to just kind of think about whether we should use uh, algorithms or machine learning, and I use these two terms uh, kind of interchangeably throughout the talk, whether we use to need these systems at the first place or not. And um, kind of, I want to start by pointing out what are some of the uh, issues that can arise when we use the system. Um, because as I said, um, most of these systems make pretty accurate decisions in practice. Um, so let me just start by an example, and this is um, motivated by hiring. Um, so many of the tech companies these days basically use algorithmic tools um, to rank all of the resumes that they receive. And a human is just basically look at the top ranked resume and decide which one of these person they should proceed with an interview or not. Um, so a few years ago, um, people figured out that Amazon's resume screening tool um, basically downweighted resumes that contain the word woman. So if you were the president of the woman chess club um, in your high school, that was something that was, the tool was waiting against you when assessing your resume. Uh, so Amazon responded uh, with this by tweaking their algorithm to make it neutral to these gender terms. Uh, but that kind of did not really solve this problem. And sort of the, the reason for that, and this is something that um, I touch on a little bit throughout this talk, is um, basically machine learning um, fit a model to the majority of data. And in this case, it turned out that most of the applications of Amazon uh, to Amazon are men. So kind of there wasn't really enough data about women to kind of make the algorithm learn more about uh, which one of these applicants uh, should they interview or not. Um, so sort of like, if you think about uh, this as a sort of bias, uh, the sort of bias comes from the fact because uh, your data uh, has the bias itself and the algorithm just learns uh, the biases from the data. This turned out to be not the case all the time and we see an example of it in a second. Uh, so the other domain that I want to talk about is the criminal risk assessment. Um, so there is a tool um, that is called Compass. Uh, it's designed by North Point, uh, which is now called Equivant. And this is a tool that basically give um, risk scores for different things like what is the risk that this person 
goes on to commit the crime after they got released from the jail? Or uh, what is the risk that they don't uh, appear before um, their sentencing, before the hearing when they get uh, arrested at the first time? Um, so this is actually, this tool has been around for a long time. It's initially developed in 1998. And um, it uses many different features of uh, a person uh, to make these decisions. And it's just not just simply running some sort of machine learning algorithm. It uses actually a fair amount of sociology and theory to build the tool. Um, so what happened was in, uh, in 2007, uh, in 2016, ProPublica looked at um, these two compass. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with ProPublica, it's a nonprofit um, and it does investigative journalism established in um, 2007. Uh, it has hundreds of journalists that has won many awards. Um, so they basically studied Compass for 11K defendants in Boward County in Florida. And the way that they did that is they using public records, they basically matched uh, the, these 11K defendants um, to, uh, to their criminal record and just kind of figured out in the next two years whether they went on to commit the crime or not. So here, um, if the tool was doing things in a more sensible way, uh, then the people who were predicted to be high risk uh, would have end up committing the crime uh, more likely than the people who were uh, labeled as low risk in the next two years. So ProPublica basically followed up with dependents for the next two years to figure out uh, whether they ended up committing a crime or not. Um, so what they actually found out is um, the Compass tool has two times more false positive rates for African-Americans compared to white. And by that, I mean um, the people who were labeled to be high risk, twice as likely were not going to commit the crime um, if they were African-American compared to white. So you see another sort of disparity um, in, in this sort of algorithmic decision-making. And that sort of brings me to um, the first area of my research, which is, um, called algorithmic fairness. This has started since 2016, 17 through the machine learning community. It has been around uh, much longer through the data, uh, data mining community. Um, so it's basically, the goal here is we have all of these algorithms, we have all of these uh, kind of machine learning models that make really good decision uh, that are accurate, but there might be other problems that these tools don't address. We saw two of these problems uh, in the two examples that we see, and there can be many more. Um, so the field sort of like started by revisiting uh, many of these established problems in the field and um, try to think about how can we mathematically define bias? Because I didn't really tell you what bias is. I just say this is a problem. Um, what does this mean from a technical sense? And once we have a sort of like a technical definition of what fairness or what bias would, might mean, uh, we want to kind of like now revisit all of these settings uh, to see how, how we can tweak our algorithm to be bias free. And basically, we want to also understand what are the costs of enforcing these sort of mathematical notions of fairness in, in terms of um, degradation in performance. We also want to understand um, what are the relationship between different notions of fairness. For, for example, if you think about the first application, the notion of fairness that is used was different than the second application. Uh, so maybe in some of the settings, we want to kind of have more of these uh, notions of fairness at the same time. And we want to think about what sort of trade-offs or incompatibility result we get. Um, and um, those um, letters um, are basically some of my work. If you're interested, I can point to, to, uh, to some of these work that I have done in this area. But in general, some of the main challenges here is um, fairness or bias, depending on how you look at it, uh, is generally domain dependent and very subjective. So people think differently. Um, and uh, there are different ways that the bias was created. So in the Amazon screening tool uh, example, the bias happened because the data was sort of unbalanced and did not have enough um, female applicants in the pool. Uh, in the compass, the bias is kind of happening because of the algorithm in addition to that. Um, so you want to kind of think about what are the sources of unfairness and how to uh, remove bias based on those. Um, and as I said, data and models in practice are often privately owned by um, some company who has all of the rights. So it's really hard to figure out 
uh, how these models work and how they make the decisions. And furthermore, um, there is really no regulations regarding any as aspect of the things that I talked today. Um, so it's just kind of hard to enforce these things in practice. Um, so I'm gonna end this um, first part, which was about fairness, uh, to talk about explainability and trust. Um, so to kind of think, put things in perspective, you can think about the first part as um, some, so fairness is basically some desiderata that we want from our algorithms or machine learning models. We might want more. And another example that we see is like uh, the right to give explanation. Uh, so let me start by uh, another example, which is medical diagnosis. So suppose doc, uh, so many doctors these days have access to algorithmic tools that basically um, give them diagnosis for the patient. Um, so how can we make the doctor to trust these algorithms and the prediction that the algorithm makes? And one way to do that is to provide explanation um, for the outcome that the algorithm predicted. Um, so for example, here you will see um, the model is predicting flu uh, and the doctor is unsure. So the model is basically giving an explanation in the sense that it says your patient is sneezing and has headache, but there is no fatigue. So flu is the most likely outcome. So this is one way of kind of generating trust um, of these systems. These explanation can depend on, um, can be person specific or domain specific. And we see examples of that in a second. But the other way we can provide uh, kind of trust to our system is we can output a certificate that basically describe how how does the algorithm work? And you see an example of this in the next um, domain, which is about bail decision. So in US, unfortunately, we have 20, uh, 12 million arrests uh, per year. And in most of these cases, the judge have to make a bail decision. Um, and some of the time the judge has access to an algorithmic tool to help them make these bail decisions. Um, so you want this algorithmic tool to be working very accurately um, and also be free of any bias. Uh, usually the problem is the pre-trial pre detention can last a long time. And uh, this might cause some problem for the defendant. For example, they might lose their job because they have to spend uh, a lot of time in jail pre, pre their trial. It also can have consequences for society because you want to make sure that people uh, who would end up going to commit a crime if they get released pre uh, pre-trial uh, would not grant it bail. Um, so basically, similar to the Compass example, um, there are tools that basically tell the judge uh, what's the likelihood of the defendant to commit a crime while on bail. Uh, and to kind of make the judge trust these systems, um, one way we can do that, is to provide simple heuristic for the job, for the judge that kind of explain how the model work. So for example, you see one of uh, the examples of such a system uh, is actually kind of complicated uh, for someone who does not have a computer science or machine learning background um, to, look, to kind of understand what this tool says, but it's basically a bunch of like if statement that if the current offense is felony, and if the prior uh, felony is yes, then uh, I'm going to commit, predict that this person is going to commit a crime or not. But this is basically one other way of kind of building trust. So now, instead of giving explanation, now I basically tell you how does my algorithm came up with the decision by just giving you a simpler model that explained the decisions. Um, so this brings me to the second part of um, what I've been taking mainly uh, the last two years, and that's um, again a subfield of artificial intelligence called explainable AI or XAI. Um, and there are many questions that people have studied in this field. So one sort of like very basic question is when should we build uh, complex models? Um, so in the context of the Compass dataset that we see, um, Cynthia Rudin and her team basically showed that no matter how complex of a model you you build the performance is not going to be better than this simple heuristic that says some person is high risk if they have at least three prior offense um, or two and they're between 
21 and 23, or they're younger than 21 and male. So this is sort of like, no matter how complex you are, um, your accuracy is not going to be better uh, than this simple heuristic. So just kind of questions why we should use complex models to begin with. Um, the other problem that people think about is uh, how sh can we design uh, interpretable algorithms or explanation? Because sort of like what you expect as an explanation might be different if you have an image versus if you have a text data. Um, and also depending on the domain. And the other question that people think about is, are there actually, there have been a lot of efforts in people coming up with different algorithms and techniques uh, for explaining um, the decision of a machine learning system. And there has been very little kind of understanding or are there any sort of connections between different sort of explanations? Um, and one thing that I haven't really covered here is I give you an explanation um, we want to think about how good this explanation is, how useful this explanation is, and how to measure these things. And there has been very little research about these things. Um, so some of the challenges, again, is um, similar to fairness, kind of interpretability is often subjective and domain dependent. So something that might be interpretable to me uh, might not be interpretable to someone who does not have a computer science background. Um, and also, there is another major problem that uh, there are many techniques for explanations and they often disagree. So here you see an example of uh, three different images. And on the left-hand side, it says, what is the object that we are trying to explain in the image? So for example, the top left one is a junk bird, the middle one is a corn, and the last one is a terrier. And different explanation methods basically give you um, drastically different sort of explanation on how the algorithm thinks the object in the image is what is it as labeled. Um, so which one of these explanations are better? How should we resolve the disagreement? These are kind of some of the challenges that people face. And I think um, this is all I have to say. Um, so we can stop right here and see whether there's any questions. Yes, that's quite an interesting bag. So as we said, look, to open the event to questions and, and thank you. It's quite a few things to come to mind. So please feel free. I think, are we all on one screen? I think we pretty much are. So feel free to either raise your hand or be recognized, or you may, we might be able to get away with just simply uh, unmuting and share your reflection on, on the topic. Uh, if preferred though, you can type your comments in chat and Stacey will read them out loud or you can send them directly to her. So does anybody want to start the discussion? I see her. Yes, Hi, this is really interesting. I know that it's kind of a broad overview of your work, but kind of moving forward, are you thinking of like what kind of um, what kind of tools decision makers can use to actually help with this interpretability? Um, is that something you're interested in or kind of where the field is going? Um, yeah, so that's a great question. Um, and yeah, I've been thinking a little bit about this uh, very recently. So one of the last papers that I cited, uh, we basically went on and uh, survey a bunch of um, data scientists and also a bunch of data scientists that use these techniques um, on, in their day-to-day -to -day life to kind of understand how what, what are some of the features that they want from these methods and kind of like how they would like how they would think one method is better than the other. So kind of one of the problems right now is we don't really know, uh, we don't really have a good kind of metric to determine how good is an explanation or how interpretable a model is. Uh, so kind of like, I think the first sort of step towards that is to just kind of understand um, what do we need and what do people who use this tool want? Um, so we actually did a survey to kind of like understand these things. And I guess the main finding is um, of that survey was people basically don't really uh, prefer one of the one type of explanation over another. And this turned out to be very domain dependent and also example dependent. Uh, but people had some general criteria that they want 
from these methods to satisfy. So going forward, if you want to come up with your own explanation method or kind of build your own interpretable method, maybe it's good to have these things in mind that this is like a list of things that your interpretation or explanation should satisfy. Uh, did that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Sure, Rosina. Thank you, Shaheen. Um, this is very important, the whole thing. Thanks for bringing up the whole um, discussion about the compass. But I was thinking about Gillian's question is, and I, and I was seeing Gillian, uh, your work with decision makers, the whole, the whole point of this work is not longer have decision makers, human decision makers making the decision, but having the algorithms making the decision. So that is the point that I wonder how you in your field feels about that. And I wanted Shaheen to comment if he has looked at that perspective of the fact that these algorithms are making this fundamental change in, in the way that people work because we're just, before we used the computer systems used to deliver information and then people could make decisions based on the information given by the system. Now this change is that these systems are making decisions. So I wonder how much of this discussion about fairness is in fact a discussion because people do not trust or people simply just don't want to let computers make decisions for them? Yeah, that's a great question. I don't think I have quite a um, satisfying answer to that, but in some of the examples I gave, um, you see that the tool is basically simply giving you a recommendation. So for example, in the medical diagnosis, the doctor is going to make the call about like, what is your diagnosis going to be? The tool is just giving you some sort of like, um, ex um, some sort of like prediction that you can use or you can ignore. Uh, so here there is a trust issue, uh, but also this comes to sort of uh, setting that there is a human in the loop that sort of intervene on the decisions of the machine and the decisions of the machine are not going to be like, um, enforced directly, but there are other settings that this is not the case. For example, you, if you apply for a, a credit card, there is an algorithm that basically denies and decides on the fly whether you're going to get the credit card or not. Um, so I don't quite have a clear answer for the question that you asked, but um, I, I think it's a, I, I haven't been thinking about these questions that much, to be honest, but that's a great question. Peter. So thank you for this uh, fascinating talk. Uh, I am actually very encouraged to learn that uh, the, uh, the artificial intelligence is not going to take over and control humans. And it seems to me that if you are interested in having algorithms which are perfect, that requires that there is a tremendously diverse team of people who are involved in developing algorithm. Uh, you just mentioned the medical application. Um, you would probably need to find out whether anybody who developed the algorithm knows the difference between the genders or diversity or ethnicity and what are the potential impacts on developing the algorithm. Because I don't think that just explaining to the medical doctor how the algorithm uh, works would help very much. Even NIH right now requires that if you are doing any clinical trials as a minimum, you need to include the representative uh, part of the society and especially uh, gender because they do react in a different way. Uh, so that's, Take it or leave it, but uh, it's like a focus group. You really need to have 360 degrees of vision here. One question which I would have is, 
In one of your slides, you used adjective accurate. As an engineer, I'm very allergic to this word. So would you care to elaborate a little bit? What is, what is accurate algorithm? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so kind of to get to the first point, um, there has, so most of these systems, not the medical application per se, but most of these systems, when they were built, they were just built um, with the purpose of sort of maximizing some objective without really understanding all of these nonsenses that you mentioned. But uh, more recently, people have been trying to understand um, or kind of like have a diverse team uh, to help them kind of sanity check how does the algorithm make decisions or how should the system be built or what features are important and what are the distinctions. Um, to answer to your second question, um, that was intentionally made way by me. Uh, so you can think about um, accurate as whatever performance metric you want to uh, optimize over. If you care about accuracy in the sense of like machine learning accuracy, so that means if you have something with low, um, with high accuracy, that's accurate. If you think about calibration, if something is calibrated, that's accurate. So sort of like that was intentionally left vague, and it sort of depends on what um, what objective function you have and what domain you're looking at. Did that answer your question? Well, um, I would dispute the the use of accurate, but maybe offline. Yes, thank you. Ed? Yeah, sort of the way I think of this working is, yeah, you say sometimes people put their theory models in, et cetera, but the pure AI approach is to give the computer the data and give the computer, say, discrimination information. Here are the people we hired, over the past five years, here are the people we didn't hire over the past five years, then ask it to figure out what the pattern was. Problem is if the company has a bias, so they're not hiring women or they're not hiring people of color, then you're feeding that bias right into the algorithm. So I would think this would work better for like a medical diagnosis. You know, there you got a gold standard. Either the person has the cancer or they don't have the cancer and you can determine that. How do you get around that bias with something like hiring? decisions where there's you got to give it something to tell it what to look at that's a great question um this is actually um there are people thinking about this question and uh they're using tool from causality um so sort of you can think about uh, counterfactuals in the sense of uh, we know what happened to the people we hired we know how good they were but we don't really know what would have happened to the people we did not hire. And this is an example that comes up every day. Um, so sort of like the bias gets built into your system because you keep like using data that is biased. Uh, so people have been thinking about these questions uh, through the lens of causality. I do not um, honestly um, work that much on these things, but there, this is an active area that people are, have been thinking about. And this is not just a problem that, um, that comes into um, just, just like if from a fairness perspective, but um, th this is a problem that like machine learning also deals with because if you want to make a very accurate system and you don't have ground truth data all the time uh, because you only have ground truth data on the decisions you made, uh, how would you make sure that your model is in some sense doing the right thing? Uh, but that's a great question. Yes. So I'm wondering if there's any work or if you've given this thought to sort of the ethical aspect or perhaps even taken to extreme if there's any legal aspects to um, accountability for and of whom, of the author of the algorithm, of the designer of the algorithm to, to have some responsibility for an impact of that error, you know, the margin error. If if the algorithm had, you know, we're talking about profiling, right? In, in in many ways. So if you're if you're making some, if the algorithm sets the um, parameters, do people against whom it's applied have a right to know how this is being applied to them or how they're being categorized? Does is there something you know that 
in, in the way these uh, tools are coming out there for use, um, I imagine licensed or whatever, that people have a right to see um, you know, what, what aspects of their characters being brought into a decision that might affect uh, you know, anything from their health to their ability to, to be set free from prison or you know, everything, all the different, these are major decisions that could affect people's lives. And um, what's sort of the, the access to information about it and, and for, for um, sort of some protection of the person against who it's being used or with whom it's being used. Yeah, that's a uh, great question. Um, so let me give you an example. So basically you can think about fairness as one desiderata that we want from our system. And sort of this field is pretty new. So people haven't really been thinking about these questions, but to just give you a sense of what sort of things are possible. Uh, the other desiderata that we want from these systems might be privacy and uh, very recently, privacy has started uh, around two the sort of differential privacy, which is the standard notion of privacy in uh, theoretical computer science, started in 2008. So they're like ahead by 10 years. Um, so the, the way that they reflected um, um, in sort of like regulations and law, um, the most common example is GDPR, which basically give you the right that your data uh, can be deleted if you want, you have to give consent. Uh, your data cannot be stored um, on, uh, encrypted. Your data cannot be stored in many different ways. So there are all sort of ways to sort of give you the right. We don't quite have that yet uh, for any of the topics that I covered. And as I said, uh, sort of like the, the field is behind by 10 years. So it's not uh, surprising that we don't have all of these things and sort of like the regulations always um, move sort of on a slower pace than sort of the research uh, from the academics. But um, currently we don't have those things, but um, there has been a lot of arguments. Um, so the main conference that um, I attend basically now try to incorporate a bunch of policymakers and lawmakers. Um, it's, it's been going back and forth because sort of the language is not clear. What do we mean by fairness? Just like, how can you write it down as law? Um, but there has been some effort. It hasn't lead to any concrete uh, outcome yet. A lot to learn still in this new field. Are there any other thoughts or triggered or experiences maybe anybody's had with, with yet uh, being faced with it? And that's the other thing would, like for example, if you're facing a judge, Judge Judy there, now, I know that when it's on the TV show, I understand because a friend of mine actually was, <laughs> was selective for this. You, you signed off on a lot of things that you would agree without questioning whatever the decision is for, for a certain benefit. So, but is there, is there something that uh, people even know? You know, if you're applying at one company or another that they're going to use an algorithm, that your resume, however it's presented, will be uh, encrypted and, you know, scanned. Maybe or, you know, now everybody is sending it electronically, but to have some processing of it. Um, is there any awareness of that or is that a service sort of surprise? Uh, yeah, so there, there has been a lot of sort of lawsuits regarding these. Um, without that, I actually myself was a subject of one of these lawsuits recently. Um, so it turned out that um, the loss, there was a lawsuit against Facebook that they, systematically I'm Iranian, um, kind of ignore applications that are coming from certain uh, citizenship countries. So my country of citizenship is Iran. Um, so I got an email, which I thought it's kind of spam, turned out not to be a spam from the Department of Justice, um, that they actually found Facebook to be guilty during the time that I applied for a research scientist job there and got auto-rejected on the spot. Um, so there has been efforts like this, but they've been scattered around, not in a systematic way. Rosina? So I was thinking, you brought up something interesting. Uh, should these algorithms even be allowed to be used? But the point is that I, I know of someone who is a recruiter in an important uh, 
big local company that was responsible very recently we heard that was responsible for 3000 hiring jobs a month one person if they do not use machine learning algorithm which i would think it would be great if they do if they don't use that they're going to use keywords which is way 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 worse and what where are the lawsuits against people using keywords or using the web. So that's that's the point, which comes to an area that I do not understand. You know, why are those people making such a fuss on things that if if there have been much worse things going on using computing? At least now there are some more intelligent algorithms being used, which is to the benefit of everyone. But it's now a matter of people only for one simple, which I consider a mistake, which was in that 1956 workshop at Dartmouth. The researchers there decided to name the field artificial intelligence. If the fewer field had been named something else, I don't think we would be going through all that. I would like. Shaheen to comment and also others. Yeah, so this is a great point. So basically, we started using uh, these systems just basically uh, because of the fact that the human could not really deal with the sheer amount of applications to a field. But sort of like to give you one simple example that was why we should think about whether we need to use these algorithms or not. It's actually really simple to fool. Uh, this is not something that I advocate for, but this, there, it's really simple to sort of uh, fool these um, resume screening tools by just copy pasting the description of the job in white ink into your resume that a human cannot see, but sort of the machine thinks you have a high match to the position that you're applying for. Um, so there are sort of like obvious problems with using machines and there are also obvious problems with just having a human working on it. And uh, I guess, uh, what I meant by this is um, that you need to kind of think about whether we need to use the models or not. It was just kind of like, can we at least think about these sort of obvious problems that might happen before using these things in practice? Uh, but I know I don't really have an answer um, to what would be the alternative here. I, and you remember that I showed that, that the two videos that we cannot distinguish but the algorithm considers one being of a class and the other not a class. So I'm fully aware of that. But I think that who should be held responsible are the companies that give one employee the responsibility for 3000 recruits a month. Because if, they, if, if somebody says, okay, you really cannot use machine learning algorithms then they are going to go back to use keywords, which is going to be even worse. Yeah, that's a great point. I, I, uh, I'm, I'm watching Anne's expression because between us, we certainly still read a lot of text of applications, you know, and it, it, uh, it's, it does take a lot of time, but I'm sure that the human process of sorting them out also have even though we set up our procedures and you know have things we're looking what kind of evidence would indicate this requirement or that requirement but that would be an interesting question too how, if you compared the actors or <laughs> sorry to use your work there but if you compared the results of a prediction would it be would it be hired if it were the person or the machine that were just doing the sorting i don't know there's some very interesting questions there um I guess and sometimes we also would be delighted if you had a thousand applications these days. So it's also a question of volume. It certainly is a question of volume. Oh. Are we, do we have any other questions or comments to, did we not ask you a question, Chan, that you wish we had so you could, you could uh, share another insight you had? <laughs> that would be, um, I ask our, our candidates for <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
I have another question if you if you want. Yes. To. Sort of a I'm sort of a technical sort of ish question. Obviously, I'm a statistician, so most yeah. of the time the models we come up with can be translated into a visible decision tree. You did this, you did that, did the other thing, or a regression model. My understanding, am I correct, that some of these more advanced artificial intelligence systems produce decision models that nobody can really parse out? You don't actually know what it's doing, even if you look at the guts of it. Is that true? Yeah. Um, so essentially, the, the idea here is um, you can push these simple models. And this is also another kind of coming back to Rosina's model or not. Uh, Rosina's question that like, one other thing that you want to think about is whether we need a very complex model or we can get around with using a simpler model like the models you proposed. But there are newer machine learning technologies like deep neural network. There has been around, there have been around for a long time, but now with sort of like the amount of processing power that we have, we can train this highly non-trivial model that even if I tell you, uh, so they have hundreds and thousands of parameters. So even if I tell you like all of these parameters of the model, you can't really figure out how the model actually work. There are ways that people try to kind of uh, figure out how does, how do these systems work, but it's highly non-trivial because it's just, there are just so many like things that they can fit into in their parameter setting. So yeah, they can learn many, many, many neural network. That's kind of the one that I was thinking of along those lines, yeah. Yeah, but your intuition is correct. Well, let us thank you again. I, I must say, I've just checked my little um, AI monitor here and we probably scanned the, the recording to check for different indicators, which we won't share with you what they were, but it's coming out loud and clear that this has been one of the most successful and interesting uh, scholarship conversations we've had. And I very much uh, appreciate uh, Shahan and ask the rest of us too. Also to thank you very much for giving us your time and feeding us some interesting food for thought. Yeah, my pleasure to be here. Thank you so much.